Well, welcome everybody. A lot of you know Tom, know of him. Um, uh, my my um, introduction will be very brief. Um, uh, he really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, uh, Tom uh, is a native of California. Uh, he, we were talking with Judith Kelly a little bit earlier, reminded me that Tom uh, worked his way through college uh, and um, ultimately um, ended up in, at University at UC Davis. UC Davis, which I think of not, the, not in connection with colleges but wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of one, one of the few um, wine, um, schools that teach about how you make wine and how you grow grapes and all of that sort of stuff. That's what they're famous for. But but he's really the reason they're famous at this point. Um, and after graduating from there, he went to business school um, and proceeded to work for Bain and Company uh, for 20 years, uh, the last seven of which uh, he was a worldwide managing partner of Bain and Company. Uh, he actually, this is a, not a happy, a financially good time in Bain's history, uh, and he and um, someone whom uh, you, you know by the name of Mr. Romney, uh, basically arranged the, the buyout of Bain and Company at that point. He became the CEO, worldwide managing partner of Bain, which he, served, which he in which role he played the turnaround. Now, the, if I remember the figures correctly, uh, the, the, uh, the Bain multiplied its, its earnings by six times um, before, by the time he left, uh, t and having decided that he wanted to do something um, more widely, directly beneficial to the public. He was always interested in, when, even when he was working for Bain earlier, in nonprofit activities. And he, he launched the Bridge Band Group at that point. And those of you who follow nonprofits know that Bridge Band Group, probably in most people's opinion, uh, is really the gold standard for consulting for nonprofits and, and philanthropies and, and individual philanthropists all over. Uh, uh, it has grown rapidly. He's been heading it for 20 years. He pointed out that this is this is the point at which his career actually moves dominantly nonprofit after having been basically for profit uh, for the preceding 20 years. Uh, in any event, uh, the Bridge Band, its work in education, its work in uh, with with foundations and and philanthropists uh, has has made tremendous difference in terms of, um, of winning um, uh, admiration from foundation people. I'll tell you one anecdote, personal anecdote. Um, when, Tom, when Tom decided to, uh, to uh, start launch Bridge Band, uh, I was at Atlantic Philanthropies and helped, went, offered to help him go out on the road and raise money from other foundations because Atlantic provided for only for what was estimated then at being about half of its requirements for five years. Um, and one of the foundations that we went to was the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, and and the, the president of whom I knew very well, um, but unfortunately it was, a, it was a dry well as far as Bridge Band was concerned. She just, she just didn't see it at that point. About four months ago she called me up she said, Joel, I've just come from a meeting with the two best consultants the Pew Charitable Trust has ever had. They're both from Bridge Band. She said, and I just want you to know that I made a very serious mistake when I didn't, when I didn't invest in Bridge Band. And she was serious about it. I, she launched the call. Uh, she has since apologized about it. I said, well, you know, you learned from the lesson. And, uh, and in, in any event, uh, I have to tell you, there's, if you talk to almost anybody leading a foundation today, they'll tell you that, that Tom is the one whom they look to. Um, this is enough, Joel. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. Uh, in any event, welcome, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here again. Um, and I'm looking forward greatly to what you're going to tell us. Well, thank you. You know, I wish um, I wish I had the time to interview every single one of you and listen to what you have to say and to share because you all have a combined set of experiences and including some of you that are still in school 
that are extremely relevant in so many dimensions. So unfortunately, I'm going to do a lot of the talking, which I actually don't like to do. Um, but we'll do that. That's what Professor Fleischman has asked me to do, and I will do it. Um, and I've learned, by the way, to follow his instructions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I bet some of the rest of you know how that works, too. Huh? <laughs> so we're going to cover a lot of ground, and I'm going to start with a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is this is all work in process. I'm a work in process. Probably some of you are work in process. We're learning and learning and learning all the time. So what we're going to talk about today is philanthropy's promise. We'll talk about philanthropy. And I know some of it's wrong and some of it's incomplete. We're going to cover a lot of terrain, lifting us up a little bit to try to understand what patterns are existing, what's happening out there vis-a-vis -vis philanthropy, with an eye toward increasing social impact, period. I always fi fixate on the poor child. Any way you want to think about it, what can be done to increase society's health? So disclaimer, work in process, don't know what I don't know. Philanthropy you probably know, is defined as love of humanity. And it's evident around the world in every single culture. And it's evident across this country. And America is the most philanthropic country in the world, by far, measured any possible way. And there's a promise, and I've been thinking about this for years, there's a promise implicit in the concept of philanthropy, which is we're going to use our resources to make things better off. Not worse off, better off. Got it? And there's another implicit promise, which is, you know, those of us that have a little more, we'll do a little more. We'll kind of do our share. Growing up, my parents taught me, you do your share and then some. Do your share and then some. So there's this implicit promise, and that's, that's what I've been wrestling with, actually, for a number of years. Does philanthropy fulfill that promise or not? Now, this image, you kind of know where I'm headed on this. My answer is the promise is a little bit unmet. And today we're going to unpack what's going on under the surface. Why is that happening? Both on the impact per dollar that's given away, but also the number of dollars that are given away, because both those things matter. So my thesis is philanthropy is falling short. Despite all kinds of great intentions, and despite all kinds of momentum, and I'll touch on some of that, we could do better. And by the way, the reason it's falling short is not because anyone is making it fall short. It's a structural issue. And what I want to point out in the back end of my remarks is a unique and potent structural problem that is impeding philanthropy. And I actually think we have a solution to address that. And this is, in fact, the first time I've ever talked about the solution. So it's probably wrong. <laughs> At least it's an idea that can, we can debate. <laughs> a little bit of stage setting around bridge span, just so you guys can all understand what we might know and not know. Because we have a lot to learn. And like any of us, our experiences are, are limited. Um, we are a nonprofit. We started 20 years ago. We're an independent NGO. That is independent of Bain and Company. Our origin story is interesting, and I'll just give it one minute, because it is not even a remote exaggeration to say Bridgespan would not exist. I would not have pursued my, if you will, career in social change for the last 20 years were not for Joel Fleischman. Period, end of sentence. I was running a company called Bain and Company, as he referenced, and a mutual friend said, gee, why don't you meet Joel Fleischman, Tom, you have this idea of spinning something out of Bain. We'd spin out Bain Capital, and I had this idea of doing something that would be for society. So I came down to Duke, gave a talk on the nonprofit sector, which, by the way, with hindsight, I knew not, did not know what I was talking about. And I'm, <laughs> I, I hope no one remembers anything about that. And then this guy invites me to New York. I said, I'm thinking, why to New York? He's here. So long story short, months later, I show up in New York, and I'd been talking to him about this idea I had. And I go into this nondescript building, anonymous everything. There's no name on the door. There's nothing. And I show up in his office. And he says, that idea you have, I would like to help you with. It's a professor at Duke. OK, that's nice. What do you mean, help me with it? I want to put up the money. I said, money? 
Atlantic Philanthropies, anonymous. Then he says, now if you tell anybody, we're going to claw the money back. And I said, I'm going to tell my wife. He said, I've got to tell my wife. I'm going to serious all <laughs> way worse problems. <laughs> Let him tell Karen. So long story short, um, Atlantic not only put up half the money, that was 1996. He then spent the following three years helping me raise the rest of the money. We were on trains and planes together and cars all over the place. That's where I learned about wine. And we raised the rest of the money, put a board together, and I launched, and I stepped down as CEO of Bain to do this. So Joel Fleischman, point one, and there'll be a couple more points later on, Bridge Band would not exist today were not for him. Period, stop, end of sentence. Now, Bridge Band has evolved. Let me mention the mission just so you have an anchor point. Bridge Span was designed as a nonprofit organization to help disadvantaged populations and disadvantaged causes. When we assessed the social sector, we said, you know, gosh, there's universities and hospitals that are fantastically important. They can get a pro bono case from McKinsey or Bain or somebody else. They've got resources. These organizations that serve the disadvantaged, they're disadvantaged. They don't have resources. They don't have access. And problems of the commons, the environment, things like that, they don't have spokespeople. How do they find resources? So we set up as a nonprofit so we would chase impact, not chase money. That turned out to be hugely important. And you can see from the mission statement, strengthening the abilities of mission-driven organizations. That's morphed over time because we work now in impact investing. So mission-driven organizations and philanthropies, both sides of that equation, I'll get to that in a moment, to achieve breakthrough results. It was all about impact. We're not interested in incremental change. We get incremental change, but we want to aim high. Society is too important. The needs are too great to aim low. So this is a kind of rallying point for our organization. There are three bridges in the concept of bridge span. I'm going to use bridge metaphors a lot today, so just deal with it. One is the original bridge of business to the social sector. The other bridge was theory and practice. My co-founder, Jeff Braddock, was associate professor at Harvard. He said, we can't just do stuff. We have to teach. We have to do stuff from which we learn that then we can teach. So from the very beginning, We've had an orientation toward content, intellectual property, ideas that would benefit others for free. And then there was this bridge, and this has turned out probably to be the most important bridge between capital, money up here, and the communities and causes that need services and help and ideas down there. That's the bridge. Because you could be a specialty organization serving foundations and wealthy individuals. You could be a, an NGO working in the front lines. Our aim was try to straddle both of those. Those were the bridges. Now, we got a lot of stuff wrong. This is not a complete list. We dramatically underestimated the degree of difficulty. Not even close. I mean, not even close. I reread the, re the business plan last night at the plane. It turns out it is. Surprise, a lot harder to change the life of a child than it is to build a widget. It's just harder, period. In addition, we got the business model wrong. We originally thought, stupidly, I thought, that we could rotate people out of Bain and put them in bridge span and they rotate back, kind of Peace Corps. Didn't work. The work's too different. It's too hard. People who are working in corporate setting can't plop them down in this social sector all these stakeholders and there's volunteers and there's different sorts of capital and everything's different. You can't just make your head spin, so that didn't work. We have some externs at lower levels, but we had to build our own organization. We completely missed some fundamental themes like the voice of community. We completely missed racial equity. And the importance of that lens and orientation in driving social change. So we missed some big stuff. We did get one thing right. We knew we didn't know much. And so we had this learning attitude that allowed us to learn and adapt. And, and some of you have been involved in helping us learn. Because we really said, we don't know very much. Then that business plan, it said at year 10, we couldn't imagine past year 10, we would have $7 million of a budget, $7 million budget. Um, we're now in year 20, we're about 60 million, something like that, with 300 people and five offices. And gosh, the numbers sound great, but the numbers, the numbers are not really what matters. What matters is that we've been trying to scale our impact 
dramatically faster than our organization. I'm going to give you a very quick snapshot of something I created to try to show that. So there, core consulting practice, nonprofits, foundations, kind of where we started with this idea around knowledge. Then knowledge over the years expanded and expanded. And knowledge is probably 20% of our budget, something like, like that. We cover 70% of our budget with fees and 30% we raise from philanthropy. Then we morphed, we expanded from serving foundations to individuals. And I'll get into that in a minute because that turned out to be a big step. It's very different working with a foundation staff versus working with high net worth people trying to put their own money to work. Then we evolved our knowledge into something we call multi-year initiative. Think about these as campaigns. One of the most powerful ones recently is called Pay What It Takes. Pay What It Takes is donors pay the true cost of what the organization needs to cover to deliver its services or its, or its uh, uh, impact. As opposed to arbitrary, it's 10% overhead, which is the stupidest darn thing God ever created. I don't know why. We could spend hours talking about that. Pay what it takes was a campaign. We raised many millions of dollars, said it's going to be five or six years. We put a consortium. Darren at Ford was one of the lead. Got five foundations to sign up for this. Two years of struggling, going through their portfolios. They make an announcement. They get five or seven more foundations to sign on. So that's a multi-year initiative, which we're going to do more and more of. And they're really almost kind of low A advocacy kinds of things. Then we moved into local. This is very cool. We took the consulting model and said, you know what, there's a better or at least a different model, which is what if we went into a city, our first was Atlanta, and worked in cohorts of nonprofits, 50 nonprofits in a city, take their executive teams in groups of seven or eight at a time for two years and help them with consulting projects, but also help train them. It turns out that took out 80% of the cost of the consulting project. It gets higher net promoter scores or as high as our core consulting and you build cadres of leaders in a city. So we're now in leader city six, and we probably serve 1,200 leaders, three or 400 organizations, and that we can scale to all kinds of cities. It's a completely different and actually quite disruptive consulting model. We're now moving that and taking that content. We have eight consulting units, and we're digitizing it for teams. Not for individual execs. This isn't exec training. Teams have to go through this. We've now put 200 teams through it already. And this works in rural areas. It works in the developing world. This is a way to take a consulting-like service to more nonprofits, smaller nonprofits in more places. So kind of interesting. One of the more recent developments over the last five years is building off the nonprofits, foundation, individual work, we'll call it platforms. Have any of you heard about Audacious, the Audacious idea? Audacious project. So Audacious is a kind of collaboration between TED and Bridgespan, and it's identifying big ideas, bringing donors together privately to fund them, then putting them on the stage at TED. Check TED this April. You'll get to see. And that turbocharges these organizations, their ideas. And so think about it. It's private placement, public sourcing, private placement, public sourcing. Lever for Change is a new platform. Blue Meridian Partners. Uh, which is an outgrowth of, of uh, Ed McConnell Clark Foundation, co-impact. We see these platforms as leveraged ways to move more philanthropy more effectively to more and bigger organizations, more, more organizations with more upside. All of this in the, in the spirit and orientation around driving impact. And then over the last five years, we've tried to expand this globally. We've always done about 20% of work globally. That number's going up. We've opened up in India four years ago. We're just now opening up in Africa. The map looks, by the way, much more grandiose. We're like a, an ant outside the United States. You say, now, Tom, why is any of this relevant? Well, the reason it's relevant is it's these intersections. The intersections between, for example, individuals and nonprofits, between consulting and platforms, between local and global, all of this is kind of this melting pot. Another thing I got wrong, we call it the Bridge Band Group. It's not a group. All these things are integrated. And, and therein lies this power of, of learning. One of the more profound and important elements that came out of this was this. So another Joel Fleischman, book called Give Smart. Joel and I collaborated to write this. It was when we were driving from foundations into trying to do individual work, we didn't really understand it. 
we we spent two years doing research, talked to gazillions of people, wrote stories, did analysis that became GiveSmart. Now, why does GiveSmart matter? And now I'm going to get at the promise of philanthropy. The headline that the reporters, you might remember this, latched onto when we started doing press things and speeches was the statement that the natural state of philanthropy is underperformance. The natural state. So philanthropy in general, give it a C. It doesn't get an A. So how could that be? Once I gave a talk, it was actually with Jim Collins. Uh, he and I were doing as a favor, a, a group that had about well, maybe 40 individuals, couples, high net worth people. It was in Colorado, some fancy place, I don't remember. And I started out my talk in a very unpopular way. I said, well, all of you are active philanthropists. That's great. It's voluntary. You've got to admire that. But half of you, half of you, based on your philanthropic capabilities, are below average. <laughs> and only four of you out of all the 40 are in the top 10%. And you just could feel. Because philanthropy is like Wobegon. Everybody's above average. It's like a pass-fail test where you grade yourself. You can't fail at philanthropy. You actually can. But, but, it's, but it's really invisible. It's underperforming. It's giving that money away and helping one child and you could help 10. Or whatever units you want to use. So we concluded from our work, and I got you know the the genius of foundations over here that, OK, the natural state is underperforming. It's nobody's fault. It's just hard. It's really hard. There are a lot of stories, success stories that came out. So you can point to the positives. The glass is half full. You can also point to the, to the gaps. So hmm, this was in 2011, and where I first started to think the promise of philanthropy is incomplete. It's falling short. It's really hard to drive change. In this space, excellence is self-imposed. If you don't really want to get the most out of your philanthropy, you won't. There are too many pressures. Everybody tells you what you want to hear. Everybody says you're great. Everybody wants money. When you give them money, nobody says, I wasted that money. Man, I did a bad job. <laughs> they don't say that. None of us say that. I'm a nonprofit. So oh, that, don't, don't, no, don't, don't give me anything else because I'm really underperforming. All the systemic and behavioral elements of this combine to make it really hard to hit the ball out of the park. So as we did this work, it became clear that in order to really get results, you have to turn, if you will, our, our sector on its nose just a tiny bit. If you're a philanthropist, you tend to think, here I am. I've got the money. I have the power. You, many of you are in nonprofits. You want the money. You're never going to get the power. So you tell me what I need to hear. You were, so there's a power imbalance. Donors, even the most humble ones, tend to think about themselves up in the foreground. The way it really works, the recipe for results is this. You want to see the recipe for results? It starts with communities and causes, interacting with organizations and collaborations that are driving change in those communities and causes. All of the action is up there. Donors are helpers. They're helpers. If Some people around here like basketball. If this were basketball, it's like these guys are buying the balls and renting the courts, and it should be in the stands, and once in a while providing some advice. They aren't actually touching the ball or making the shots. These people are touching the ball and making the shots and scoring the points and saving the lives. Not these people. And the best philanthropists know that, but they get confused <laughs> because this is where the power is. And you've got one other group of people out there. I call them the helpers. I'm just a helper. My epitaph will say, he tried to be helpful. <laughs> That's it. And bridge span and other intermediaries and service that were just helpers. We're there to help sometimes the doers, sometimes the donors, Sometimes the communities and causes and all of them. So that's kind of the, the recipe. Now, the reality is our society falls short. And this is one a second reason why the promise of philanthropy underperforms. The doers are un undercapitalized. They lack the capacity. They lack what they need to get the job done. 
We did, in the course of this pay what it takes work, an analysis of the best, the best grantees of the top four or five foundations that were involved in this. The best grantees. You know how much cash they had on hand? Less than three months. The best grantees. Bridgespan for years had two months. Now we're at six. Our board likes at nine. Duke has a little more capital than that. But the fact of the matter is, these organizations are often lacking the resources and the support they need to get the job done. So our system falls short. Now, OK, you say, my gosh, that's a structural problem. There aren't enough helpers. Somebody said the other day to me, good help is hard to find in the social sector. It's just true, because you can't make money here. It's really hard to scale these organizations. It's super fractured. The quality is inconsistent. Donors sometimes head, withdraw because they can't be certain they're going to get results. So the, our formula for success for impact here actually underperforms. OK, gosh, Tom, is, there, is this it? Is there no good news here? Well, actually, there's a ton of good news. There's actually a lot of good news. And if you take a dynamic view and you think over the last 20 years, or even the last five years, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of profound changes in investments and in dynamics in the social sector that didn't exist. You know, SDGs didn't exist years ago. The concept of big bets, meaning big, persistent, stick with it, didn't exist years ago. Impact investing didn't exist. We've talked about pay what it takes. You know, crowdsourcing, $17, $18 billion of funding last year in crowdsourcing didn't exist. Venture, the phrase venture philanthropy didn't exist. Social entrepreneur phrase didn't exist. Social return on capital didn't exist. Aggregation funds like Blue Meridian Partner. The SSIR didn't exist. The Case Center, I don't know if the Case Center exists. I bet it didn't 20 years ago. Uh, Forbes Philanthropy, I mean, just none of the pledge didn't exist. There are now 200 and some pledgers, 150 some in the US. None of this stuff existed. And you could go on and on and on and say, my gosh, Tom, if you took a snapshot of this, of our sector, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago today, you'd say, look at the change. Oh my gosh. Oh, and by the way, talent flows. Brisbane gets 200 applications or so for every entry level position. I go give talks on campuses and people are interested in social change. How cool is that? And by the way, they're interested in social change. They can be mid-career and interested in social change. Universities now have these mid-career kind of repotting programs. You want to make a difference. OK, go from. Call it go from success to significance. So a lots of positive dynamics going on that, that really give you hope. Say, OK, Tom, so there's the promise of philanthropy. Maybe we're going to fulfill that promise, because look at all this good stuff that's going on. No, we aren't quite going to fulfill the promise. Why? Well, let's talk about the pledgers for a minute. I'm going to use that as a segue into, into more talk about philanthropy. There are 200 some pledgers. And they're pledging. And they've authentically said, I want to give more money away. But when you look at the numbers, the money actually isn't flowing in the way that you would maybe hope it would flow. So OK, what is going on? Well, in 2018, the beginning of the year, Bill and the Gates Foundation funded Bridge Fan to do some research on how to unlock more philanthropy among high net worth people. Because I have conversations with folks all the time. I say, I want to do more. I want to do more, especially on social change, where it's really complicated. How do I do more? Now, those of the nonprofits said, listen, we can help you do more. Just come on, give me, give me some checks. Give me some. It's not that easy. So I'm going to double click on some work that we did. We called it Four Pathways. It was published in, I guess, the end of 2018, something like that. It was rigorous. We interviewed dozens and dozens of high net worth people, but not just that. We All the research, behavioral science, we had, it's the best we could do anyway. I'm sure some other people could do better, but it, it, was, it was OK, all 77 pages of it. And the executive summary is the first 44 pages. I'm, I'm kind of kidding. Um, <laughs> and we focused on the wealthy in the United States, wealthy defined as $500 million and up, which struck us as wealthy. And we said, look, what's going on with them? 
and, and by and large, you can figure out who they are. It's not crazy complicated. Um, so what's going on with them? So here's what's going on with them in three numbers relevant to philanthropy's promise. There are 2,000 households, this was 18, that had that net worth level or above, with roughly four trillion in assets. Now that arithmetic is interesting in and of itself. And I'm not here to talk about capitalism or the tax system or anything else. It's just, you know, even with the stock market the last couple of days, that number now is probably way closer to four six, four seven than it is four. And maybe there are more than two thousand, and this is US only. It's okay, that's interesting. And out of those 2,000, you know, 150 or so are pledgers. Um, Bridge Spans met a lot of these folks, not 2,000s worth, but many, many over the years, and some of you connected in that, in that zone as well. Okay, these are mostly self-made people. What's going on with their philanthropy? Often when philanthropy is reported, it's reported in a way that makes no sense or is irrelevant, which is as a percent of income. That's just a tax thing, right? I mean, that's how you do your taxes. That doesn't tell you much. So percent of assets is what really matters. So here's the third number that was the aha. I'm not sure anybody had ever actually triangulated on it. We did it back for many, many years, and it didn't change. 1.2%. So now just envision this. You've got 2,000 people, which you could probably put somewhere around these couple of buildings here. And they've got four, four and a half trillion in assets. And they're giving away 1.2%. They roughly, distribution looks like demographics, the boomers. So median age, mid 60s. So you've got some that are different, age, you know. So they're getting older. Oh, and assets have been compounding over 20 years at uh, high sixes, low sevens percent over a 20 year period. Obviously, any years, last 10 years have been especially great. So, okay, Tom, let me get this right. If assets are compounding at 7% a year, your wealth doubles in 10 years. That's just the magic of compounding. And you're giving away 1%. And of course, 10 years later, you're 10 years older. So is this giving while living? Uh, not really. Oh, and by the way, the 1.2% includes giving money to yourself, which you can do through a DAF or setting up a foundation. So I give money to me, and I'm there. She said, oh, this is interesting. What's going on? Now, there's good news and bad news. And this is glass, maybe it's not half full, one third full. These folks are giving away 45 billion a year. No small shakes, right? Thank you. Thank you, honestly. Come on, that's a ton of money. Well, how would 2.2% feel? <laughs> like, way better. <laughs> OK. So. Oh, and by the way, if you run arithmetic and you use long-term averages and you say somebody wants to be half as wealthy 20 years from now as they are today in nominal dollars, using the last 20 or 25 years of asset appreciation rates, just general numbers, you basically got to be north of 10. Compounding is like a, a very interesting dynamic. You got to be north of 10. No one. Chuck Feeney might be the only human being in life that's ever even come close to that. He's the founder and benefactor behind Atlantic Philanthropies. So gosh, what is going on? We kind of tried to unpack this. And unpacking it is complicated. It does not lend itself to online surveys. You know, why don't you give more money away? It doesn't, that's not a question people can answer. Oh, and by the way, I don't know about it, if you've ever seen uh, couples, Karen and I have been married 36 years now, and you know, it's just fantastic. And once in a while, we agree. Um, you know, but when we disagree, she's right. Uh, the, the reality is, people are all different. Philanthropy is really personal. So this doesn't lend itself to easy surveys. The other phenomena that's very important and is historically a, 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 a departure is most of these folks are not contemplating foundations in perpetuity. They are not, Gordon and Betty Moore, when, when Gordon left uh, Intel and they started their foundation, they hired 59 people, beautiful offices in the Presidio area, and they endowed it with whatever it was, two or three billion, they're putting more money in later. And they said, great, go do it. they pay out 5% a year. That's not what these folks are doing. These folks have a family office with two people in it. 
or if one a couple of consultants helping them they are not staffing up staffing up might be you know uh, open your network staffed up to 100 or something like that and other people might be staffing up to 25 or 30 but people are not staffing up gates foundation separate category in and of itself by and large people are doing this themselves now if you're trying to give a lot of money away and you're doing it yourself unless you are you know don laura arnold fantastic they're doing it full time full time with great staff so that's a model but if you're not doing it full time with a staff and you're kind of bootstrapping it ooh it's not easy so that's the context so we tried to unpack in this paper the four pathways what's really going on and without going into all the detail you can look at it if you want giving to social change and this is different than building a building at a university let me just so we use the word social change the phrase social change let me just be clear what we mean we basically carve out the institutional giving where it is relatively straightforward your hospital uh, big arts organization that you might be on the board of uh, universities K through 12 private schools you know when we started bridge span I had the head of a very very wealthy private school trying to convince me they were disadvantaged because we worked with disadvantaged population not actually but you are in some ways so that's a whole thing so set that over there then over here put the other stuff that really is pure social change human services problems of the commons the stuff many of us actually are committed to and devoted to it's not a perfect line because universities have huge profoundly impact, uh, impact on social change so I'm not I'm just trying to bifurcate the sector a little bit so when you're giving to social change there are mindset challenges and practical challenges the public risk is not an insignificant thing you remember when uh, the tech founder of a big social media company gave 100 million dollars to a school system how'd that work now you can argue gosh that was done on television you can argue a bunch of things about that he did give 100 million dollars to a school system that really needed it blowback you know another founder of a major tech company last week announced a 10 billion dollar commitment you go online social media whew, look out it is complicated to give money to social change it was before and it is even more complicated now so it feels like there's a little public risk associated with that a higher bar for success it's hard to change a life it's easier to build a building not to disparage the value of buildings they're hugely important it's just harder you know when the building's built <laughs> right you can measure I remember when I early on at Bridgespan I, I visited uh, boys club in New York it's been around decades and decades and decades and I was there at night and the director's taking me around and I said tell me how you're interacting with philanthropists he said you know they want me to measure stuff they want to measure everything and went by this classroom and it was it was maybe seven o'clock at night and the classroom was was filled with children five six something like that and he said it always makes me emotional he said here's what I can measure they're going on the street I said I don't need a randomized control test they're here they're not on the street but we want to measure stuff and and so it's kind of a complicated space when you don't want to waste your money it, sourcing oh my gosh how do you know this is a more fragmented harder to measure quality the teams are different I mean it's just hard and then these those are mindset things you go oh my gosh it's easier to build a building or easier to do something that is more tangible or do nothing and then you've got practical you know, how do I find opportunities people talk about absorptive capacity this by the way is BS there's massive absorptive capacity massive just take all those human service NGOs and give them six months of cash instead of three voila how much would that unleash in terms of people aiming to hire talent and and invest in this year's you know software anyway that's a different story lack of personal relationships they don't they went to the university but they're not into they don't go to Dorchester <laughs> they don't drive through Harlem they don't know these places this is not being disparaging it's just the reality so there are all these things and the research pointed this out time and time again all of which I agree with but it's incomplete because there's something else that's going on here that is deeply personal deeply personal and I, I struggled with how to articulate it so here's what I've decided today to call it 
the thing that is underneath all this that holds well-meaning philanthropists back from investing more in social change. It's swamp monsters. It's a technical thing. <laughs> there are swamp monsters. And in prepping for the work today, this conversation rather, I tried to think, I believe in pattern recognition. I went back to all these conversations, dozens and dozens of conversations over many years, saying, are there patterns? Beyond this kind of research stuff, are there underlying patterns? And there are. And there are three swamp monsters. And I could trace back in almost any conversation where people hit walls or got, you know, you could give 10 million. Why are you giving 100,000? Why not lean in? You have the capital. Why not? These swamp monsters, boop, up out of the swamp. There are three. Imagine you're on this bridge. <laughs> it's a little tiny bridge. And you're trying to get over to the land of social change and do good. And you encounter this first swamp monster. <laughs> and that, that swamp monster is delay. I can do this later. There's no use-by date with philanthropy. It is optional. Now, why would somebody delay? I can give you half a dozen reasons right away. They range from, I got to sort things out with my spouse, and I don't know how I'm going to involve my kids. And by the way, emotionally, I'm going to live. I don't want to think about my dying right now. <laughs> I had a tech entrepreneur. This won't surprise anybody. A tech entrepreneur who's in his early 40s say, I said, why don't you get going? He said, Tom, I'm targeting 120. I'm going to be alive at 120. That would be years. And I can start my philanthropy when I'm 100. All right, that's a concept. <laughs> Good luck. What, what vitamins are you taking? And I mean, I mean flip, but I'm not being flip because people don't know. And longevity is increasing. And so you don't want to give, you know, Yogi Bear said when you give it away, you don't have it anymore. So you actually don't, you want to be thoughtful about that timing. Why else would you delay? I'm a really good investor. I can make more money. I'll have more money to give away five years from now. That's often true, right? I really can't figure things out. I don't have time. I'm doing it myself. I have two staff people. I really don't have time. Someday when I sell my business or retire, which they maybe don't do, or when they do retire, then they're busy other ways. So there are all these reasons for delay. That's Swamp Monster 101. It is a pervasive swamp monster. Because while philanthropy is, is, is delaying, kids are dying. Or climate change is happening. Or economic mobility is collapsing. And dropout rates are escalating. There's a cost to delay. There just is a real life cost to delay. And any of us that are in the social sector and looking at social change dynamics in this country and around the world, would, there is a cost to delay. That's monster one. There are two more. The second one is apathy. It's kind of not my problem. I can't deal with it. It's too big. I can't deal with it. Look at US education. It's complicated. The Gates Foundation couldn't really sort that out. How can I do it? Climate, that's a political problem. Isn't China the greatest? So we get, it's a China political problem. Economic mobility, what the heck do you do about that? So there's this, it's too big, it's too complicated, I can't really deal with it. Shut it down. And the third one, which is the toughest, and it's furthest under the surface, but is almost always there, is just plain, ordinary fear. I don't want to waste the money. I did a video series years ago called Conversations with Remarkable Givers. I had the privilege of interviewing, I don't know, 40 or 50 people. I was off camera just asking questions. Two hours, and it was an amazing lineup of people from Linda Gates and Ted Turner to, I mean, just amazing people. And just question after question after question after question. One gentleman, and we used maybe 5% of the content and put it online. One question, well, one gentleman said, Tom, I had to go to 20 sessions with a therapist before I could bring myself to give my money away. And he said, kind of laughed, but he said, he said look at I started a business that failed. My marriage broke up. I started another business, failed. I struggled, my hands were, I mean, decades, decades, and now, now I've got it. 
You want me to give it away? Are you sick? Are you sick? I just spent 30 years building this. I'm not going to give it away. I'm scared of giving it away. Or I'm scared of making a mistake. I'm scared of doing harm. I'm, having, I'm scared of giving too much money to small nonprofits that become dependent on me. And pretty soon, I'm their benefactor for the rest of my life. So fear is a big one. So OK, now, where are we with philanthropy's promise? Natural state is under performance. Even when you're trying to do it well, it's hard. All these impediments, especially around the system of nonprofits being undercapitalized, further complications. Wealthy people even want to do more, have barriers to doing more around social change. Say, OK, is there a way? I mean, how is this going to, is there a way out of this box to possibly capture more of the promise of philanthropy? Yeah. But let me start with the situation. Really successful people, metaphorically, end up on islands. If you're really, really successful and you're really, really wealthy, say, most people you encounter want something, <laughs> including your friends. <laughs> they want something. They want to use your, your, they want access to your money. They want to be, hang out with, they want something. And that's not bad. It's just when you're really wealthy, the volume goes way up. You find the airports. I flew in an airport a couple weeks ago, and I was in the, you know, the, the bus over here, and there are all these private jets over there. There's nothing wrong with private jets. I'm delighted people can fly that way. But you become a little more isolated. Oh, and by the way, if you're really wealthy, you have to worry about security. You have to worry about your kids' security. You have to worry about your privacy. You have to worry about all kinds of things. So there's a little bit of an, of an island attitude if you're super wealthy. Just human nature, not a good or bad thing. Gated communities <laughs> exist for some of the same reasons, right? So it starts with that. But imagine this island is in the middle of a river. And there's two riverbanks. And you're on that island, and there's a riverbank over here that is prosperous and has big buildings and blue skies. And it's growing. And it's doing great things for society. And you are happy to invest in that part of the river. Happy. And the reason you're happy is there's this bridge that you've crossed over because you went to Duke University. Or you, you were in Mass General when they gave you that operation that really helped you. Or do you know these people? You're from that side of the river. At least at some point in your life, you're from that side of the river. The greatest philanthropic success story in this country is higher education. Bar none. It's not even close. Followed quickly by healthcare, at least the infrastructure we have. It's unbelievable. When we did the four pathways work, trying to figure out how capital could better flow to social change, I did a quick analysis of the top 20 capital campaigns in universities in the country at that time. Just 20. We cut it off at 20. Harvard was in the middle of a university a campaign that was, I think, targeting 9 billion. Some of you will probably remember. I don't remember, but it wasn't 10. They hit 10. Um, total number for that 20 capital campaigns, $77 billion. Now just think about that. $77 billion. That's not bad. That's fantastic. That's incredible. Look at this university 20 years or 30 years or 40 years ago. Oh, and by the way, shout out. Who led the first billion dollar capital campaign in the history of higher education? <laughs> Just a footnote for history. Here. So the capital that's flowing over on this side of the river is unbelievable and incredible. And a good thing. And a really good thing. That's not the issue. The issue is the other side of the river, social change land, which doesn't have big institutions, doesn't have alumni, doesn't have relationships with all the people, has never visited the island, sees the island through distant binoculars. And it looks kind of dark over there. And if you're on the island, 
no, I've not really been through Harlem. I remember our first client was Ed McConnell Clark was the donor in Harlem Children's, then Reedland Clinic. Jeff Canada, before Jeff Canada was the Jeff Canada, he was just Jeff Canada then. <laughs> and, and so I was visiting him, and I had a taxi driver taking me to Harlem. I said, I'm not gonna. He said, son, I'm not taking you to Harlem. Yes, we've got to go there. He said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, come on. So of course we went there. But the point is, this is not territory people are familiar with. So there isn't a big, whoops, what happened there? Eh. Technical assistance, can I do this? Sorry about that. So there's a footbridge to carry my bridge metaphor. And it's, it's a kind of jagged footbridge. And it looks kind of scary to go over there. You're not familiar with it. It's not a bad thing. It's just how it is. Oh, and by the way, those pesky swamp monsters are on that side of the river. At least they're prevalent. I said earlier that one of the things Bridgespan missed early on, up until probably five, six, seven years ago, were issues around race and racial equity. We're going to publish a piece soon around racial barriers to capital. This is wildly profound. Because if you're a person of color serving communities of color, you, you don't have the same networks. You don't have the same access. Sometimes you don't even have the same language. You don't have the same you know, way of being. And so the, this dynamic is even worse for people of color and communities of color. Say, oh my gosh, Tom, you've taken me. The promise of philanthropy is here, and there's all this good momentum, and now it's, it seems to be declining. What's going on? Well, I'm going to make it worse for a minute, and then we're going to get better, and then I'm going to wrap up with the answer, an answer, an idea. Not surprisingly, at a time in our history where inequity is increasing, where economic mobility is declining, where the spotlight's put on the haves and have-nots, it's not surprising to note that there's a tiny bit of criticism around philanthropy. Now, you read this, and you kind of read it saying, they don't get it. Or you can read it saying, there's stuff they're talking about that I don't get. And where there's smoke, there's fire. So I'm not here to say one thing or another about the criticisms of philanthropy other than we all ought to pay attention and learn from what other people are perceiving right now, because it is real. So there's this criticism of philanthropy, but one of the things those cr critiques are completely missing out on is the impact philanthropy has had on the world and our country in particular. And it's not just higher education. And once again, can't resist. Phil Fleischman wrote a book called The Foundation. It's outstanding. The casebook is better. The casebook, which was, I think, an afterthought, Joel, identifies 100 success stories from philanthropy. And people don't even know this. And by the way, this is the National Merit Scholars. New York Central Park, public broadcasting, prostate cancer, foster care, elder care, marriage equality, civil rights. You could go down, uh, Philanthropy Roundtable wrote, wrote a whole, created a whole dic uh, encyclopedia. It takes a forklift to lift the thing. Just on success stories of philanthropy. Bridgespan probably has 500 to 1,000 incredible philanthropic success stories. Billy Shore's one. You know, and you, you say, okay, most folks don't understand that. So you have to balance the critique with the reality. Right now, in this country, there have never been more opportunities for impact. And it's being driven by incredible leaders. And I'm not going to go through these. And this is a subset, whether it's Ellen driving the end fund, trying to help kids in Africa avoid worm infestations, to Andrew Yoon, also in Africa with small shareholder farmers, Kevin, incredible leader of the Y, Pat Lauder, you know, youth villages, you go on and on. This is a subset of better known individuals. I could give you 500. I'll give you 500. We'd probably give you 1,000. And you guys could add up to, and some of you probably are in the same category. Incredible leaders that are achieving results, but lack the resources to take things to the next level. At the same time, the talent flow into the social sector, as I referenced earlier, has never been greater. And Bridgepan probably has 
I don't know, three or 400 alumni, virtually all of them are in the social sector. MBA programs, when we started Brisbane, virtually no MBA program was paying any attention to the social sector. And the first one might have been Harvard with a, it was a John White had committed to social enterprise there. Try to find an MBA program now that doesn't have some emphasis on the social sector, right? This is a great thing. So we're learning that it's not just about personal success, it's also about making a difference in the world. So the talent is incredible. And many of these people are building bridges to that side of the river in various kinds of ways. And this is by no means exhaustive. We talked about audacious moving capital from high net worth people in public sourcing, Blue Meridian, uh, idealist.org moving talent, giving compass. That's actually something that was started by Jeff Rakes at, uh, who used to be the CEO of the, of the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. A volunteer, mi women moving millions, a community of women with committing a million dollars least lever for change incubated at MacArthur, spun out. You heard about the hunter and change competition, now doing running competitions for other people who want to put more money to work around really cool causes. There are the co-impact, which is basically a, a kind of blue meridian aggregation fund, but for system change out the United States. I could give you 50 of these. And you know, including some that have been around a while, like New Profit and New Schools and Draper Richard Kaplan and Robin Hood and Tipping Point and Echoing Green and Energy Foundation. These are all bridges and bridge builders. So now we can imagine something. We can imagine this kind of this side of the river that's kind of a little hard to figure out and hard to get to and the swamp monsters. We can imagine more bridges. More bridges. More bridges between the sources of capital and ideas and leadership that are here and the communities and causes and organizations that are there. So, aha. So that will help us capture the promise of philanthropy. Because these bridges are not just people who are aggregating capital, they're universities, they're research institutions, they're people who are figuring out what works and what doesn't work. There are people that are teaching. OK, all right. So that's exciting. I was asked in the context of the Four Pathways paper what it would take, which was somewhat the presenting problem around that research, to unlock another percent. And I said, just a percent. Well, it's just a percent. It's $50 billion a year. So what would it take to unlock $50 billion a year for social change? in a way that isn't just shoveling money out the window that actually makes a difference. You want it to be effective. So that's a head scratcher, right? What would that take? I don't have all the answers, but I've been thinking about it a lot. And then when I started thinking about it, I thought, is there any kind of an analog? Has anything like this ever happened before? At any time in the history of America's social sector, has there been a transformation in, if you will, the infrastructure? Because this is kind of, I mean, we have all kinds of infrastructure problems in this country, right? Whether it's roads or bridges, you name it. This is a diff different kind of infrastructure problem that wasn't too relevant decades ago when there wasn't all this capital built up. You could give money to the United Way. You could give money to other places. It was fine. It was easy. If you had a little trust at the end of your life, it was all a little trust. Now, whoa. We don't have the infrastructure necessary to move capital in this direction. We have done a brilliant job as a country and a society of building infrastructure to go in that direction. I'll give you one little footnote. Two universities I know, not this one. Uh, Full-time equivalents in development. One is 500, the other is 650. This is not numbers that are normally published. So OK. How many of you in social change organizations have more than 25 people in your development department that are well paid? I mean, how many of you have a development department, right? And by the way, if you get a really, really, really good pe person, where do they end up? They end up on that side of the river, because, well, you can pay better. It's transparency. Our son works at Duke in development, so for the arts, which is fantastic. I love it. He's great. Over here, they don't have those resources. I bet, you know, Bridgespan this year is probably working with 150 NGOs. I'd be astonished if taken together, they have 
200 people in development. A lot of them might have 5 million in budget or 10. And, and he just did, where does that money come from? You have hard enough time getting money for programs. Where do you get money for development? And so the investment on this side of the river is wildly lagging. So, OK, Tom, how would you unlock a percent? How could we build the infrastructure to unlock a percent? Percent's not a stretch goal, by the way. Stretch goal would be five points to actually have people giving while living. That looks, they're going to be funny foundations in perpetuity, the rate things are evolving. So how would we unlock a percent? I've struggled and struggled and struggled, and we've thought about campaigns and advocacy. And then I remembered this happened before in a different way for a different purpose in a way, but it happened before. Hmm. Could it happen again? Now, when did it happen before? It happened in the 80s and 90s. It happened in a, an anonymous organization who created a program to fundamentally transform our social sector, led by Joel Fleischman. And most of us don't know that story, but actually it's published. It's just hard to get your hands on it. I mentioned that Bridgepan was funded by Atlantic. Atlantic put up half the money. We had to raise the rest of the half. Here's a list of a few other organizations that may not exist today and certainly wouldn't be as strong as they are without that effort. Urban Institute, NYU National Center on Philanthropy and the Law, Echoing Green, Indiana University Center on Philanthropy, City Year, Independent Sector, Hauser Center, Board Source, Volunteer Match, Civic Volunteers and Experience Corps, Public Allies, Teach for America, National Center on Family Philanthropy, Maryland Association of Nonprofit Organizations, Power of Attorney, Compass Point, New Profit, Ashoka, Community Wealth Ventures. That's not the full list. At that time, Atlantic was the leading funder and most of that time the only funder. Ford was doing some, much smaller level, they backed out, Packard. And in the space of 15 years, Atlantic helped organizations start and scale that built bridges. And now, if you look at the history of the social sector, you'll see this, if it was sunspots, you'd see this flare up that happened, all these new organizations around the time of when Bridge Band started. It was these guys, it was you. Our trustees. It was you driving that with support from Chuck Feeney and Harvey Dale. And you know what that cost? You know what that cost in today's dollars? $350 million. $350 million, want me to reread the list of organizations? I mean, bridge span alone. The impact of that 350, I think you would be hard pressed, any analyst, no matter you know, how left-brained in particular, would be hard pressed to find many social sector investments that have had a higher yield than that $350 million. So it happened before. It happened before. It could happen again. Now it took 15 years. We can't wait 15 years. We wait 15 years, the window of opportunity, all those 65-year-old baby boomers begin to say, I'm going to leave this to my grandkids and let them figure it out, which is, by the way, the pattern. That's what happens. So I'm not going to, I'm going to kick the can, delay. It's the swamp monster delay. So what does it take? Last slide. Here's where I'm ending. I think that's what it takes. I think it takes leadership, philanthropic leadership, that's courageous and audacious, say, we're going to build these bridges. We're going to invest in the social sector leaders. And some of those are you know, academic information. Some of those are technology. A bunch of them probably don't exist today. We're going to take a page out of Atlantic's book and apply it in this precious time in history with the aim of unlocking a percent for social change and 2% for social change. And by the way, we're only focused on 2,000 families. All this infrastructure, 
that doesn't just work for this. That works for everybody. That works for the person that's trying to give money at 100 bucks. I had one conversation on this topic. I've only had one or two. I'm trying to get, you know, I said, what if you had 100 development people? Crackerjack, fantastic, just working on that side of the river. Community foundations used to do some of this. Now it's all donor advised funds. Maybe they can buy, I mean, we have some of the pieces. So I'm going to end where I began, which is philanthropy's promise. I'm actually optimistic. I think when we look at the momentum in the sector, we look at how much we know now that we didn't used to know 20 years ago, much less five, even five years ago. We look at the talents of flowing into the sector. We look at the resources that are available and what's already happening. We just need to increase the effectiveness of the philanthropy that's being spent and more importantly, unlock more of it for social change. So I'm bullish. And if any of you have ideas on how to do this, we've got back of the envelope calculation, didn't just make a billion dollars up. It's not 20 billion. So what's the return on investment of a one-time investment of, ten, of a billion to open up 50 billion a year? I, I, you know, most That doesn't sound nutty. So I've not said any of this before publicly. <laughs> I'm saying it here today in honor of Joel, because of those of you that were paying attention, his name came up five times in this journey. And if you count the fact that we now own a house in Chapel Hill, that would be six times. <laughs> so thank you, thank you all. In any event, Tom, you did a great job. Uh, you'll have a standing invitation to come back, not just once every two years, but when you're living in Chapel Hill, you'll have no excuse. <laughs> well, I want one, one final, I get to one final word, because I'm, I, thank you. Um, at Bridge Band, I can say it personally, as I think about priorities, I, I try to think about the but-for test. And the but-for test is, what might happen because of your efforts that wouldn't happen otherwise? That is but for you. That's important. And you can actually think about that as how you spend your time every day, or you can think about that in the, in the context of an organization, but for a test. Because if it's going to happen anyway, let somebody else do it. And so as we think about the impact we all hope to have in little ways, indirect ways in the world, think about the but for a test. And in my remarks today in that journey over the last 20 years, when you really step back, he's not going to like this. Hard to find anybody that passes the but for test more than you. So thank you. Well, thank you.